Uh, anyway, the big movie uh, over the next few weeks, I yes. will confidently predict, is called Mission Impossible, Mission, colon, Impossible, Impossible. slash... Slash Dead Reckoning Part One M M dot N thing thing thing. Yeah. Well, yes. Reckoning. What is it? Is it a? It's it's a. Is it an N slash? No. There was what was M? the other thing you said it, it was? was a, I don't know. It was QB thing. A QB thing. Yes. No. So it's a mission. QB thing. Dead Reckoning Part One. Dead Reckoning Part One. Or just MI Seven, if you want to be easy. So, just to say at the beginning of this, you and I saw this together on mm -hmm. consecutive nights. We saw Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning Part One and Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, and you have already said that one of the things with Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny is it's seeing it the day after you saw Mission Impossible yeah. Dead Reckoning Part 1. Tough. Tough. So, um, MI goes AI. The Ooh, very good. Thank you very much. So, the, the setup you is... You should put that in your observer. Thank on. you very much. Um, you know... Why some, don't you make it the opening line? That's my suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll do that, Simon. Okay, very good. Okay, so... And I don't, I don't want to... I'm, I'm not going to do... I don't want to do anything that spoils the film, but essentially what happens is... This time, uh, the the I mean, in the past, Ethan Hunt has gone up against. I mean, most recently, he was having to save the world from nuclear bombs, and there was a thing before that with the anyway. So, this time, their enemy is an artificial intelligence that has developed its own awareness. It is it has become self aware, and it is viral, and it is out there infecting loads and loads of computers. In the pre-credit sequence, because this being a Mission Impossible thing, we start in a submarine, which is in the Bering Strait, and there is a weird thing with a kind of key, a sort of strange key that looks like a kind of, like a cruciform shape. And then from there we go, there's a desert thing, and there's a chase across the desert, and there's a shootout in the desert, and there's a findy thing, and then there's Amsterdam, and this is all before the titles come up. But essentially, the enemy that they are up against is everywhere and nowhere, baby. Thank you, you've got the everywhere and... It's everywhere and nowhere, baby. baby that's, you, that's where you're at. Silver lining. Um... And it and the one thing that that you and I said afterwards was this is we're going to see a lot of this in the future, aren't we? The AI, yes, is it's the going to you know, be it's it's the it's the it's the new multiverse. Yes, it's, it's it, going to be. All it's over. the new multiverse, and in the same way that you know we we we'd all seen a bunch of movies in which everything's happening. Multiverse now we're going to hold a bunch of movies in which they're AI. So what he has to do, it's a very very new threat, but it has a very very old fashioned key, and in a weird. Um, similarity, not echo of, because, you know, in a weird similarity to Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, the key has two parts. And when the two parts are brought together, something extraordinary will happen, but nobody's quite sure what. And everybody wants to own the entity, not to destroy it, but to own the entity because it has the power of, it, it can control truth as we know it. So it's a great big AI viral entity that there is a physical key that is in two parts. The two parts are roundabouts in the world. Everyone wants to get hold of it. And in order to do this, our team will have to chase hither and thither. And yon. And yon, both near and far. I'm going to play a clip because the clip, the clip's from sort of fairly late on in the movie, but it is, it is a sequence that everybody has seen because it's been very, very heavily trailered and we've, we'll talk about it afterwards. Yes. Featuring Simon Pegg, who is going to be your guest on next week's show from Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. Here's the clip. Well, you can see the train, right? Yes, I see the train. What about it? And you have a parachute. You got a parachute? What do you expect me to do? Well, just, you know, jump. Just jump? Yeah. I mean, Benji, it doesn't work like that. I'm not that high. There's there's ledges sticking out everywhere. I'm going to hit them before the parachute even opens. Even, Benji, even if I could get the parachute open, yes. I don't know if I can make it across the valley and intercept and land safely on a moving train. Do you copy? Yes, I copy. Look, I'm just trying to help you, okay? I need you to take a step back and pull yourself together because I am under a lot of pressure right now. So Simon Pegg will be your guest on uh, yes. on next week's and show. And Simon Pegg is in a car. And Tom Cruise is on, bike top, on top, top of a cliff. Top of a cliff, a big rocky cliff with a great big droppy, droppy jump in front of him with lots of jaggedy, jaggedy rocks sticking out. Now, this is not a plot spoiler because it, there has been so much coverage right. about this and everyone has seen the little featurette. What Tom is going to do is to jump off the cliff on a motorbike in order to intersect with a train, which is where the final act of the film is going to play out. And the stunt was done six times, 
and all six times it was done by stuntman Tom Cruise. And if you've seen the piece of, if you haven't seen the it's piece worth of footage, looking for it, it's, it's incredible. It's just, I mean, it is. And that is day one of the production. It was, oh, that was the very first day. That's the first day. Of I production. didn't know that. Okay, so it's and they built you know it's a ramp and all the rest of it, but it is actually Tom Cruise on an actual motorbike, actually jumping off the top of this thing, and then actually falling, and then actually opening a real parachute, actually, and then he does it six times because after he's done the first one, he says, "I think I let go of the bike a bit early." Damn, <laughs> it how just, did that happen? He just keeps doing it. So. Here's the thing. You know that when Tom Cruise does an action movie, he is going to go the extra mile. And I, we were talking before about, you know, whether, whether he'll be remembered, you know, in decades to come as one of the great superstars. And one of the things that he will be remembered for is, are you not entertained? How much more can I do? You know, in a previous Mission Impossible film, there's a there's a scene in which he broke his ankle because he was doing his, his own stunt. But this really is, I mean, even just watching that that little thing, and of course, there's a moment when the director, for Chris, the director Christopher McQuarrie, is watching it on the thing, and then Tom lands safely, and somebody hugs Christopher McQuarrie because they obviously one of the things they were thinking was, please let this go right, please don't let something terribly wrong happen. This, so as far as the rest of it's concerned, it is the usual uh, Mission Impossible stuff, and I, I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean it's the the plot is kind of a, a lot of join the dots stuff. Uh, AI is not new but it is absolutely of its moment we're all sort of very concerned about you know the robot overlords taking over so there are sequences involving rebecca ferguson's uh, ilsa faust there is a teaming up with hayley atwell's uh, light-fingered grace who is a thief and there is a there's a sequence is hayley atwell related to winifred atwell the pianist you you'd have to ask her okay. Did you ask Simon Pegg when, when oh, you speak Simon to him. Simon Paul, you could look it up. And um, so there's a again talking about stuff that's in the trailer. There is a there's a terrific uh, chase sequence uh, down the Spanish Steps. They actually had the premiere of the film by the Spanish Steps, in which they're in a very little Fiat and they're handcuffed together. Again, weirdly enough, kind of oddly mirroring scenes that are in. I'm not saying but mirroring scenes that are in Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. But, but done much better. But done well, certainly done much more. Indiana Jones and Dial Destiny wants you to kind of just, you know, enjoy the old fashioned, you know, look, it's Harrison Ford and somebody else and they're in the thing. But what this wants you to do is be absolutely on the edge of your seat. Because there's one of the things I like about this film. And it succeeds. And it succeeds, is that there is a kind of caper quality to it. So the stuff with the little cars going down those streets, it's it's kind of got an Italian job feel to it. There's a lot of screwball comedy interaction between the two. You heard a little bit of it there with uh, with Tom Cruise and Simon Pegg. I think when Simon Pegg says, I'm under a lot of pressure, that it cuts back to Tom Cruise on the top of a mountain yes. with a motorbike. But what makes the film work? Also, there is a terrific uh, performance by Essie Morales, who was so chilling in Ozark, which I absolutely loved, who here is Gabriel, who is described as the Entity's chosen messenger. Have I said that it's called the Entity? I don't think you I have. have. Okay. So the AI is it's referred to entity, yeah. is referred to earlier on as as the Entity. They say, we, 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 it's a thing, we'll call it the Entity. And part of me goes, please don't call it that, because that is a silly name. And every time they say the Entity, slightly cringe, because it is a bit of a silly name, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose it is, but it's this kind of film, so they, what, they can't call it Brian, can they? <laughs> if they, well, if they had called it Brian, okay. So, so my reservations would be that you know, the, the, like I said, there is a, there is a bolt together quality to the plot. You know, the set pieces and the central thing is called the entity, which I think is a bit silly. And then there's a kind of don't look now. So I'll chase through Venice, and then there's a brilliant performance by Pom Clementiev, who is this uh, largely silent assassin uh, called Paris. But what the film does and uh, is edge of your seat, nail biting, pulse racing. Blimey, Charlie, I can't believe how exciting this is. And you and I sat there and we watched it. And it's too, you know, what was it? It's, it's, it's two, two and a half hours, but it genuinely hours. feels like 90 minutes. Wow. And, of course, it's part one. So here's the verdict. Firstly, you get to the end of part one, you think, I want to watch part two right now. I have been here for two and a half hours and I want to watch part two right now. All the action adventure stuff is done it's really really well done i mean the stuff with you know with the, the cars chasing through the little streets i mean we've seen this stuff many times before but it's done brilliantly it's it's really really nail biting when we get to the final sequence which is the motorbike parachute 
train sequence. And again, if you've seen the trailer, you already know that apparently very early on, they said to uh, uh, Chris McQuarrie and Tom Cruise said to each other, what do you want to do? And Tom Cruise said, I want to drive a, you know, I want to drive a motorbike off the edge of a cliff. And Chris McQuarrie said, I want to do something with a big train. They they did both of those. He was things. slightly more explicit. He was. He said, I know. Yeah. I just don't want to. But it's it, okay. It's, it's in on the, the poster. Tra- is it okay? Well, so what did he say then? After Tom Cruise said, "I want to drive a motorbike off a cliff," what do you want to do? Chris McQuarrie said, "I want to crash a train." Yeah. Okay, fine. And if you like me, I mean, Beggars of Life is a, a film starring Louise Brooks that the Dodge Brothers have accompanied uh, for years and years. And Beggars of Life finishes with a train going over the edge of a cliff. And of course, being back then, they got a real train and they really threw it over the edge of a cliff. And you can still go to where that train is. And it, the, the wreckage of it is still out there in the desert after all these years. That film was made, you know, like almost a century ago. And the wreckage of the, the thing is still here. And, and of course, there is a there is a there is a train sequence in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. The the finale of uh, Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning is, I think, one of the most audaciously tense action set pieces I have ever seen. And I was, and you can attest to this, I was genuinely on the edge of my seat. My fingers were digging into the seat and I was actually thinking, make it stop, make it stop, make it stop. Because what it does is it goes and then you do a thing, you go, wow. And then it does a thing and you go, wow. And then it does another thing and you go, wow. And then it does that eight or nine times. And I I started to hyperventilate. I was, and I I know that you you mentioned this, but I, I, I write notes all the way through films. Yeah. So I've got... He's got it. This is a loose leaf uh, book with scribbles because yes. some, some critics need a torch to... to oh, I don't do it with... You with, don't with, no, no, no. So because you, you just write blind. I just write, yeah. So I just have the thing in my lap and I just write as I'm working the thing yeah. and I use my... It's fine. So I've got 15 pages of notes on, on it. The very last page of my notes, they might tweet a picture of this, literally... I can't hold it up to the camera because it's an is simply an expletive which, about your hat. Yes, it said "fruitcake my hat," scrawled in a trembling hand. That because I was just yes, and then we both came out of it and we went, "Wow, it's completely brilliant." It's just. Yes. I mean, the phrase breathtaking doesn't begin to describe what the, what, you know, and it, all the way through the action pe- the set pieces are good and, the, and the, the screwball comedy is good and the caper stuff is good and the plot is silly and, you know, and the tape self-destructs in five seconds, which, and at one point they go into an analog safety room that is offline because that's where the entity can't get them. And every sometimes he says the entity, I slightly quit. Doesn't matter. None of that matters. It's, it is so exciting. It is absolutely thrillingly exciting to the point that I lost the ability to write coherent notes and simply wrote an obscenity. Do you think the BBC will have a light entity department in the future? <laughs> Almost certainly they will. Can I just, can I just say, I know we look, also, yeah. and this comes up in the interview with Simon Pegg, which, okay. you'll, which you'll hear next week, how incredible. So we're all talking about AI now. It's a bit AI. It's it's everywhere. Yeah, but they made this. They made this. This is a pre-COVID conversation. Yeah. That that. So, Chris McQuarrie was on to this story yeah, yeah, a long yeah. time. ago. No, that's absolutely else. right. More that's Mission Impossible. Right. More Mission Impossible. Did you tell up. Simon Pegg that I? Because I because I he showed. Wanted, he asked what you thought, and I said that you'd written that about his hat, and he thought it was hilarious. <laughs> and within thirty seconds, he told everyone. I wouldn't be surprised if he told Tom Cruise what you want to do with your hat. So we'll find out. uh, (laughs) But it was great, wasn't it? It was absolutely fantastic. Thanks very much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as we enjoyed making it. While you're here, check out all the other videos because they're cool too, aren't they? They are. And if you want to keep up to date with everything Kermit and Mayo's take, then check out our social channels. I mean, why wouldn't you? I mean, I I would. I have done. Excellent.